As you look at the migration trends that are going on in Europe, as you see this wall being erected on the border between the United States and, and Mexico, you hear a U.S. president talking about people coming from the continent yeah, in his comments about certain countries. Yeah. Um, state your case. Talk to me about how that makes you feel. So I like to tell this story of a very, very, very close friend of mine who we all dreamed of coming here. And I made it out. I came. And for the first few years of my time here, it was always, how can we get him to come over here? Then he got a job that paid well in Liberia. And we never had that conversation again. Most people are, I mean, these are, we're seeking the same things. We're seeking some sort of economic certainty and stability for ourselves and our families. We're trying to provide for them. And if we can, if the conditions are created back home that make it possible for us to do that in our homeland, people wouldn't come here. I ride an Uber or taxis that are driven by people from Africa, and it's the same thing. If I could make a living at home, if I could provide for my family at home, I wouldn't, I wouldn't come out here to be able to do that. But more importantly, I always said that if I didn't live in Africa, the place I would live would be here. Just because there's something about the American story, maybe it's because of the connection to Liberia too, but I have two kids who were born here. I actually just uh, came back from Cincinnati. My daughter was uh, in a soccer tournament. And even though I'm Liberian, I don't have US citizenship. My daughter is as American as can be. And there are few countries in the world where you can say that, where that's possible. And, and that's part of the greatness of, of this country. It's part of its identity, it's part of its DNA that people can come from anywhere and become a part of the American fabric and themselves become Americans, like Obama's dad wasn't even an American citizen. Like he wasn't even, he didn't even live here, right? And, and his son goes on to become president of the, of the United States. And I think there is a drive to change that part of the American identity. And- It's a mistake. I think it is a mistake because the greatness of this country is his ability to assimilate people from all walks of life who contribute to his, his, his history and it's and his, his, like this, there's a national project and every generation of Americans adds something to that project. And now we have a generation of Americans who after having crossed over are attempting to close the door behind them and completely change the tenor the, the, and, and, and nature and character of the American state. And, and I think that's, that's, that's a mistake. People are not just pulled to Europe. There's the push factor. It's the difficulty of the economic conditions at home that forces a young man to think that a trek across the Sahara Desert it's worth it. Mm. So if we can change the conditions back home, and this is where we need all our partners to be able to do that. And the United States seems to be going in a different direction. That's correct. I think uh, it's Fortress America. The walls are going up. Um, it's becoming very, very difficult. I mean, all you have to do is to ask anybody. And now it's, it's almost um, indiscriminate. In the past, it used to be that you know, people who didn't have strong uh, social or economic ties to the country would be denied a visa because the, the, there was a possibility that this person would not return. But now it doesn't matter what, what ties one has to the country, right? And so it's becoming increasingly difficult for even African students to get into American universities. And even after they get into American universities, it's difficult for them to be able to get visas to actually come and study here. At the same time, China is opening up. I like to give the example where my deputy minister for administration had been trained you know, at Wuhan University in Hubei. And the current deputy um, uh, chief architect of Liberia and even the chief architect of Liberia had both been trained in China. In my last year as minister, six of my staff were sent to China, all of them for graduate education. Those numbers continue to go up. So what used to be the case was that European businesses, American businesses showing up in Africa to do business would meet me. And we shared the background that we, you know, I had gone to Berea College, I had gone to Georgetown University. And so there was some sort of cultural affinity between the American who was coming into Africa to do business and African, whether it was economic or political elite that they were meeting. Increasingly what's happening now is Chinese businesses coming into Africa and the people they're meeting are people who were trained in China. But that's not China's fault. But China isn't actually muscling anybody out. China is just opening up more opportunity at exactly the same time when Europe is 
attempting to extend its borders to the edge of the Sahara Desert, right? Most of Europe's policy toward Africa is at, aimed at staunching the flow of migrants from Africa to Europe. And so in a time when America is building wars and Europe is extending its immigration policy to its development policy, for Africans looking for whether it's education or training, China provides an opportunity to be able to do that. The USC conference, just explain that to our viewers. It was oh, a so conference was, and then the people was, couldn't come, yeah, right? It was, because... a, it was a conference uh, um, and, they, and they had struggled the year before to get everybody to that conference. And it was a conference about Africa and they had invited a number of African speakers. And the thing is, how do you have a conference about Africa and not have African speakers? And for some reason, every single person was denied a visa. And so the conference itself had to be canceled. And then the conference organizers began to think about the possibility of actually next time hosting a conference in Africa. But that doesn't look good, right? In a time when, when Africa has been seen as, oh, Africa is a partner to the United States. You know, Africa is a partner to the United States. And yet, American immigration policy toward Africa appears adversarial, if not just completely hostile. It was 2014 when the outbreak of the Ebola virus took the lives of more than 11,000 people in West Africa. In Liberia, Jude was at the center of the crisis, serving as the country's Minister of Public Works. During the Ebola crisis, the president created something called PACE, the Presidential Advisory Council on Ebola. And who was on PACE? The president headed the, uh, this uh, council the Chinese general in charge of Chinese troops because the People's Liberation Army dispatched a unit to Liberia and they built an, an Ebola treatment unit. So the Chinese general who led the Chinese troops was on the council as well as the U.S. general because there was a huge deployment of U.S. troops in Liberia too, there. The Chinese ambassador was on there as well as the U.S. ambassador was on there, right? The person from the Chinese version of the CDC was on there as the person OFDA from the U.S. on that. And so basically we had, and the European, the head of the European Commission in Liberia was also there, World Bank was there, IMF, um, uh, African Development Bank. So all of Liberia's partners sat with us at the table when Liberia faced this moment as our greatest threat in terms of this thing that posed an existential threat. And I think what happened in Liberia as we responded to Ebola provides an excellent model of how all of the partners can work with Africa or different African countries in terms of being able to address the problems that the continent faces. And as we sit here talking, I mean, people are dying in the DRC. Of people, uh, any thoughts about that? And what was that experience like going through that, yeah. knowing that your your neighbors, people down the street are dying, yeah. there's not much you can do about yeah, it. Yeah, at some point, I remember getting a call, because you know, we're still a VIP culture, big man. So. This guy called me because his sister had become infected and the Ebola treatment units didn't have beds. So this was the time, this was the peak. People were dying outside because Ebola is a very expensive uh, disease. The Ebola treatment units have to be, the uh, infection control is so strict so that you can only take in a certain number of people for the, for the unit to function properly. When people go into the red zone of the Ebola treatment unit, they have to be covered in these hazmat suits. And it's so hot in there, they can only spend as much time in there and they have to come out. And then they, only, they can only work a certain number of hours. So the number of people you have working in these areas, and then when they come out, they have to be doused with chlorine. And there's a very elaborate process so that they don't end up getting infected in terms of being able to do that. So, because of the, the, the strictures around running an, an effective and efficient Ebola treatment unit, people were dying outside. And this guy called me because I was in the president's office. He thought I could make a call and get his sister. And just the fact that I couldn't do it, but then there were other people who didn't have my numbers. You know, It was like very heroin. And then you get to a place where you don't know if the next person coming to work has a relative at home who's been treated. So it was probably... Uh, next to the war, probably the most scary time of my, um, uh, of, of my life. But the incredible thing was that what ended the, the outbreak wasn't really a therapeutic solution. It wasn't because people went to a hospital and got, it was basically changes in the behavior. Don't touch sick people. Um, if someone dies, leave the body and wait for the, the, 
people to come and take them. Do not bury your dead. You know, it's, it's just, uh, those were the things that ended up dropping the, the, the rates of, of, of of the infection. You say it's changed people even now. They do yeah, this yeah, instead we were, of... Uh, we, it, was the, it was the handshake. No, we have the very elaborate uh, handshake in Liberia that ends with a snap, but it's like really, really elaborate and now we couldn't do it. So if you saw people, you you do that. And then every public building had like a... Every home had an Ebola bucket. Every public building had like an Ebola thing. It was like a, a big barrel with chlorinated water in it. And then before you enter the building, you had to wash your hands with the, uh, this water. Liberia is trying to improve travel within the country by spending millions on climate resilient, all weather paved roads. Maintaining those roads was one of Jude's top priorities. Achievements, everybody wants to have a lengthy list of achievements, but then they pro probably also have the, their crowning achievements. Mm. Uh, when you look back at your time in government, uh, there's always frustrations, but what do you look to as, as those achievements? I think one of them was, you know, like I said, passing the road, the road fund act to make our, our maintenance predictable and, and regular. A second one would be um, the increasing the number of uh, materials we're using to make roads. And we've, we have streets that were built 50, 60 years ago using cement that without maintenance continue to survive up to today. But asphalt roads will fail in 12, 15 years. And so when we first asked our partners like the World Bank and the African Development Bank, they said that it was more expensive. And so we ran a pilot that showed that it was just as expensive as asphalt, in some instances slightly cheaper, but the duration was longer. So I wrote them a letter to say in the future, when Liberia takes loans from you, we want to be able to have the option of using asphalt or using uh, Portland cement to be able to pave our roads. And we also brought in uh, an American company called Acro to do um, um, portable bridges. Because in a country like Liberia, you may not be able to build you know, concrete bridges, and sometimes you might be able to deploy those bridges faster. So what we tried to do was to introduce new ways of doing the exact same things we've done before. But this is what's happening, right? As the world changes, one has to be able to do that. But um, I think it was also a, a big uh, achievement for me in the number of women who were promoted to leadership roles, whether it was uh, they were project engineers or having one of my assistant ministers be female. And I tried as much as it was within my power to work with the females within the ministry to see how, what we could do in terms of the institutional culture that would make it possible for them to continue to rise up in their, in their, in, in their careers. The African Union estimates about 70,000 skilled professionals migrate from Africa every year. With limited economic opportunities, Many young Africans are migrating to both Europe and the U.S. Let me close by asking you a question. Uh, I have a friend who, who says that one of the biggest issues in the African continent, and we've talked about a lot of them, one of the biggest issues is the brain drain, that talented people like yourself go to the West, kind of become fixated, and, and that's where they land, right. and the continent suffers as a result. Um, Look into your future. Do you see yourself returning to Liberia? And even if not returning to Liberia, still having some influence elsewhere? Or how do you see your role moving forward? I mean, you're a bright guy. You've got a huge future ahead of you. Where do you see it? So first, I'll come back to your friend's comment about the brain drain. I don't think it's as clear cut. A lot of African countries, the remissions, remittances they receive from overseas, from uh, diaspora, is sometimes equivalent to the total or exceeds what they received in aid. So Africans living outside the continent, whether it's here in the United States or in Europe, basically keep the economies back home running by remittances they make back home. So there is a benefit to having that. But I definitely get the point where some of the continent's brightest lights leave and never return. A part of it, again, is we talked about the pull and the push that I really, really, recently in New York, there was this kid, I think he's eight years old, maybe younger, hasn't played chess before, he's Nigerian, and they, live in a, they lived in a homeless shelter. And he started playing chess for about a year, and he, at his age group, he became state champion in New York. And it was incredible, like, they couldn't believe 
and and the the teacher responsible for the chess club hasn't seen this kind of improvement before. I don't know if he would have had the opportunity if he stayed in Nigeria. So I think it goes back to the point that I made that for us as Africans, we ought to see whether it's China or the United States simply as partners. The growth of Africa, the, the, the growing our economies, building our countries is going to be our responsibility. And for me, yeah, definitely. So I'm uh, interested in agriculture. I have dreams of becoming Africa's uh, Archer Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> and so currently I am growing, I'm not growing any food crop right now. I'm growing cocoa and uh, oil palm and rubber. And the intent is to start with cash crops. And then if that works, then switch over to food crops. So my future is in Africa. There is no future here for me. There's no future in Europe for me. And that's why, you know, after I graduated Georgetown, I went back home. When I left Liberia, I didn't think I would ever return to Liberia because I left in the midst of a war. I left in the midst of troubles. But the weird thing was that from the minute I entered this country, I was always going back home. There is something about, you know, and, I, you know, I feel like even if I were to become really successful here, that success doesn't really matter. The success that actually matters is one that happens at home that allows me, not simply for the benefits of that success to accrue to me, but to be able to share with people who, some of whom are never gonna get the opportunities that I've had. So yeah, my future is back in Africa. Today, always a pleasure. Thanks you so All much. Right, no worries, man. <laughs>